Good to be with you all this afternoon for our live chat here on June 16th. Those of you that are watching live, uh, please mark your calendars as Lori had just uh, described for this Friday, 12 to 3. It should be a great event, um, another monthly event that um, is showcasing our 25th anniversary. So come one, come all. Uh, today's format, additionally, besides that little celebration, thank you, ladies, a uh, little COVID-19 update, um, along with uh, how our preparedness plans have evolved over the last uh, seven days. Talk a little bit about our uh, vaccine and testing distribution. Uh, David is here, David Stewart's here to talk a little bit about uh, dining services. Matt Dameron is here to talk about uh, the five neighborhoods and then uh, a little bit more information from me uh, from an administrative uh, perspective. So I'll just kick it off here with our seven day positivity rate. Um, good news since I haven't been at this podium here for two weeks. So um, over the last three weeks, the uh, seven day positivity rate uh, has dropped in the Commonwealth to 2.6%, which is just great news. Um, when we picked the, this metric back up in uh, the middle of March, March 11th, um, it was at 5.8%. So everything is um, heading in, a, in a completely the right direction, um, even uh, with the governor's announcement of uh, easing all many restrictions and capacity limits towards the end of May. In Rico County, um, the seven day positivity rate is at 1.8%. Uh, and again, that's down from 5.8 uh, in the middle of March. Our dashboard at Cedarfield uh, at this very moment is green across all levels of care. Uh, for residents and team members. That's just great news. Um, uh, keep up the great work, even though I hear many uh, stories, email, text, phone calls, uh, or stop bys uh, in the administration suite of folks that even though they, you are, are vaccinated, uh, people are still taking uh, you know, different precautions than they did probably once did than uh, pre-pandemic, um, especially around inf infection control, um, and being more in tune with our own immunity and uh, different vitamins that people have taken. So uh, keep up the good work. Our dashboard is, um, is green. As it relates to our uh, COVID-19 evolving preparedness plan, uh, there is a document in everyone's cubby box and or mailbox in uh, the main building, um, in the cottages, in assisted living, in memory support and in health center. Everyone has an updated version of our COVID-19 plan. I just wanna go over a couple of highlights um, that you will see in red on your printed copy um, that are new today than different from last week or the week before. Uh, visitation, so this is just, um, I'm talking about independent living for the apartments and the, uh, the cottages. Uh, visitation is now permitted in any visitors that come to the community are now permitted to congregate in the common space areas except for the restaurants the cedar grill uh, prima pub 2300 um, and or the atrium cafe so uh, that's a a, um, a layered um, uh, a layered uh, restriction that we have, have been lifting. All guests um, are still required to wear masks as our team members across all levels of care. Um, but in order for a guest to be in the common space area, they have to wear their mask. Um, we are now not allowing any restrictions on the number of visitors that are allowed to come to a cottage and or an apartment. So um, three weeks ago, it was four people in the cottages and two people in the apartments. And so we are removing that restriction. 
Uh, visitors um, are permitted to spend the night. Uh, we still want folks that are spending the night um, at Cedarfield to be vaccinated um, for good reason. The Virginia Department of Health um, suggests there's, a, there's many people out there that are still unvaccinated um, and uh, those particular people we want to uh, not trying to uh, di divide the community here but we really want to um, limit the exposure as much as possible to the to the disease that might be um, being carried through folks that are unvaccinated so this is one thing that has stayed on the plan anyone that is not vaccinated at this point um, is not permitted to, to stay overnight um, the capacity limits have changed at Cedar Field for example in the fellowship hall uh, we have a capacity seating of 25. Uh, we are lifting that 25 to 100. We have 100 people in the fellowship hall now, uh, which is great news. In the chatterbox uh, upstairs on the fourth floor, we're gonna increase the capacity limit to 26. And um, in the administrative conference room, the capacity, as another example, is 12. So capacities in the common space areas are uh, being lifted. Uh, the other interesting thing uh, be, it happened a year and a half ago. We, we stopped concierge services. And as of next week, um, those concierge transportation services will be back in place, meaning if somebody needs a... Um, a drive to, to a, um, a non-medical uh, event or an appointment such as getting their nails done um, or a haircut or uh, needs to see a beautician uh, that will resume on Monday June 21st uh, from 830 to 430 uh, there uh, there is a little bit of a fee associated with this type of transportation but I know many residents have been asking for it so if anybody has any questions and or would like to reserve uh, a ride, please contact uh, the concierge uh, desk. They'll be glad to help you out. Um, group exercises in the wellness building. We're now going to lift um, the old restriction and um, 16 participants are allowed to um, congregate in that group exercise room. Water aerobics is increasing to, to eight. And, um, and then the other thing with transportation, um, shopping trips are resuming with a, with a revised schedule. So if anybody has any questions about um, uh, transportation and the new schedule, please see uh, the concierge desk or go by and see uh, Will Stern down on the third floor here. So, so that's all good news. Um, the team has been working hard with uh, the Virginia Department of Health to make sure that these layered um, provisions um, are acceptable in their eyes and they agree with us. On the health services side of things, um, meaning uh, Morning Glory Avenue, our memory support area, assisted living, and the three neighborhoods up in the, uh, the health center, uh, the, the Virginia Department of Health and the Department of Social Services have not provided us new guidance yet. Uh, even as, early, as late as a, an hour ago, um, we still don't have new guidance from them. So uh, the, the, uh, the preparedness plan that we have in place as we've had it for the last two months in the five neighborhoods that are licensed um, that um, guidance still holds true. We're allowing visitation in the resident rooms as long as the guest is fully vaccinated. If a guest would like to come and see a loved one in those licensed areas, we still have to maintain um, what we've been calling for this last year and a half, visitation vistas, um, which need to be um, scheduled through uh, the, the neighborhood leader. And then, of course, um, outdoors is always a preferred option if somebody wants to come to the community, especially since we just have some gorgeous, gorgeous weather right now. So um, as it relates to the COVID-19, so all that's the, the preparedness plan. If anybody has any questions, you have a printed copy in your mailbox. Um, feel free to certainly come down and talk to uh, Renee or I or any one of the department directors. 
um, if you are a family member listening tonight or over the weekend here and have a question about the preparedness plan please feel free um, to contact the neighborhood leader or Matt Dameron um, and they can answer any and all of your questions so hopefully all that is just good news keep up the good work keep yourself safe just because we are coming out of a pandemic um, I'm sure we all have new uh, parts of that pandemic that we uh, use to protect ourselves that will probably be with us forever so keep up the good work Renee has a question about the preparedness plan specifically which guests may use the pool children vaccinated or not um, guests are not permitted to use the pool at all at this point children vaccinated or unvaccinated we have not opened up the pool quite just yet uh, for uh, guests outside the community um, vaccination distribution um, again we uh, we're waiting to have five additional people um, that want to come forth to uh, receive the uh, the uh, J&J &J, uh, vaccine. Um, so once we do have five, we'll probably have our first uh, clinic. We have not had a clinic quite just yet. We are continuing testing. Uh, testing continues on Wednesdays from one to three uh, in the club room. Good news there since for the last four months now since we've been doing weekly testing we have not uh, uncovered any positive cases of team members that are unvaccinated that are required to be tested at this point if anybody would like to join our uh, waiting list so to speak for the j and j uh, our first j and j clinic uh, please feel free to contact any resident contact ann hopper and any team member interested contact Connie McGowan and uh, maybe there's some interest out there we can get our, our first clinic going uh, I'll be back in a little bit about some more operational updates I'm going to call Matt Dameron our associate executive director to the podium talk a little bit about um, some health services updates Good afternoon, everyone. Um, just some quick updates from health services and the, the five neighborhoods and households. Um, the first one I wanted to, to mention to you was a, is a personnel update uh, in our Morning Glory Memory Support neighborhood. Um, so earlier this week, we, we spoke to the, the team and the families of residents in Morning Glory uh, to inform them that Shannon Gus, who was our neighborhood leader, uh, is actually transitioning back to dining services, and she did that uh, this past Monday, Monday the 14th. Um, Shannon's been with, with Cedarfield for the last 11 years, uh, nine of which were in dining services before she made the transition uh, to the household. So, um, we're excited to see uh, what the future holds for Shannon um, in dining services. Um, so we've, we've already started the search for our new neighborhood leader in that area. Uh, we have posted the position and look forward to, uh, to interviewing uh, some qualified candidates for, for that area. But in the meantime, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and as I will be uh, directly overseeing the neighborhood until we're able to get someone there. Um, another little update there is uh, we do have a clinical leader for Morning Glory that will start with us here in just a couple of weeks. Um, and I'll have her come up and introduce herself at a future live chat. Uh, she does have quite a bit of memory support experience and experience in life plan communities uh, so we're excited to to add her to the team but until that time uh, a couple weeks from now tamika ross our director of nursing 
um, will be more than happy to answer any um, questions about the clinical aspects of, of morning glory. So please, if you, if you have any questions, concerns, feel free to reach out to myself or Tamika and, uh, and we can help you. Um, a few things, I'm gonna reiterate one of the things that Michael was just talking about in the health services side about visitors uh, coming to the five uh, neighborhoods and households. We definitely encourage you to come. Um, if you're vaccinated, come and meet with the, with the residents in their rooms. Um, and if you're not, then we can go to the comment or the, um, the visitation vistas or outside. But we do ask at this time that you not visit in the common spaces um, until a little bit further down the road here. Um, so please stay in the resident apartments or uh, in one of those other areas uh, as opposed to the common spaces. And please um, wear your mask when you come to visit, um, when you're visiting with your loved ones. Another thing about visiting is we've had uh, quite a few IL residents, independent living residents, come and visit, uh, especially in, in our health services, healthcare areas, uh, and we encourage that. We want you to come and visit, but we do ask um, for the resident's sake that you call ahead, even if it's calling the resident or calling one of the neighborhood leaders to let them know you're coming just so um, the resident isn't kind of caught off guard by that, by that visit. So please call ahead and we'd love to see you back over there again. Uh, two bits of exciting news is the healthcare dining room has opened back up again as of Monday. So thank you, Dining Services, for helping us out there. <clears throat> um, so far, it has gone incredibly well. The residents are, are very happy to be back together again, dining with each other um, in, in that dining room. So that's open for, for lunch and dinner and uh, we look forward to continuing that on um, and opening things back up again. Another uh, exciting addition that I just worked out today uh, with Florence is the nail technician uh, will be coming back to health services starting next week. It has been quite a while since um, we have provided nail services in the health services area so starting next week on Tuesday we will be providing that service again um, and we're gonna send out a little memo to everyone so that they know exactly what times and where to go and how to sign up because it has like I said it's been a while since we've done that so a couple of exciting um, pieces for health services all right That's it. yep that is it uh, David? Good afternoon. I'm David Stewart here representing Dining Services, and I want to provide you with an update of how things are going in the dining department. Uh, as you know, staffing has been a challenge uh, for dining and for a lot of businesses in our world right now. Uh, we do stay in touch with our peers. I um, have quite a few friends in the restaurant business. It's quite a challenge right now, the, except a couple of pieces of really good news, one of which being that the um, subsidy from the federal government is going to be ending in September, so we hope that that will uh, begin to have an impact on uh, the flow of applicants to us. We have, however, you probably have noticed, I hope you have, that we've got a number of new folks working in dining services. Uh, the young folks working in the uh, server, server um, capacity in the main dining room, uh, we've got, uh, I think, five new folks. They're mostly high school and college um, younger individuals, and four of them will be leaving in the fall to go to college, but uh, they're a great addition right now and we're glad to have them. We have, uh, knock on wood, got two new cooks. Um, it was quite a, t quite a feat to uh, 
tracks track down some cook applicants one of uh, one of them came from uh, a church at one of our uh, employees attends and uh, another came as a referral so we're excited we're getting uh, near near back to full staff with the uh, culinary team uh, yet we do have a long way to go uh, in the front house I um, was encouraged by a couple one uh, one day recently to come on and, and talk a little bit about this to me it seems that it, most people would know what's going on in the uh, workforce but uh, I was encouraged to come on and, and talk about it a little bit uh, we are um, experiencing quite a shortage across our industry and uh, people are having to get real creative on how to get um, fully staffed a friend of mine reached out to me today and said they went to O'Charlie's over the weekend it took an hour and a half to get a takeout order because there was only the manager and one cook in the kitchen it's uh, um, as Michael has said one time when I was with him it's it's our new national crisis so hopefully we'll be able to make some headway here and hire some full-time servers uh, cook wise we're looking good um, I do want to express to you that one of our greater priorities is to get the cafe open when we're able to uh, the cafe is an extremely important uh, venue for everybody at Cedar Field and we're very committed to getting that open as soon as humanly possible and we have um, as you may or may not know we have a number of task forces working on the recruitment issue uh, the young people came from uh, the fruits of the labor of the task force uh, the uh, members of the task force have all divvied up different places we can reach out to high schools churches things like that and um, our efforts in getting these young people we do we have hired recently came from that task force and in reaching out to guidance counselors at high schools um, so hopefully we can find some full-time individuals to work in our service arena in our restaurants and we can begin to open back up the services that you've all loved and enjoyed for so many years so uh, I, I appreciate the uh, enormous amount of encouragement and positive support that you've shown to the team we appreciate appreciate it more than you will ever know and uh, I want you to know that we have a huge effort uh, being placed on this and uh, hopefully we'll continue to make progress we do have uh, uh, more applications coming in than we have in the past as a result of our efforts mostly young people but that's good we're happy to have uh, them apply as well so I will uh, continue to pro provide you updates as they uh, as new things develop and I appreciate your time today thank you Thank you, David. Uh, speaking of recruitment, you know, you know, there's no I. You ever hear the phrase "there's no I in team"? Um, or sometimes uh, folks say we're we're all part of marketing. Well, we're all part of recruitment as well. I found a way where 500 residents and 300 team members could be part of the recruitment team. Is anyone interested in knowing how you can be part of the recruitment team? I hear all those yeses out there. Okay, so Renee, a couple of weeks ago, made this little card, and I'm, we're gonna put this card in everyone's mailbox, or uh, if you're in the cottage, uh, out in your uh, mailbox outside, um, if you're in assisted living, we'll slide it under your door because it's kind of hard. It'll get buried in that mailbox. Um, every team member already has this card. I have this card in my wallet. I have this card, many cards, in my car in case I don't have my wallet. And what it is, it's a recruitment card. If you're out and about in the community at a restaurant that happens to be open, or you receive good service from maybe somebody at a hotel close by, um, and you think that the person would fit our culture and or maybe their job skills are transferable to working uh, in aging services, I want you to keep this card and hand it to them. On this card has information of 
of our website. It has our mission statement. It has our, our phone number, our HR email address. Um, it has the fact that we have won four years in a row a Richmond Times Dispatch uh, designation. And so this is, it has some work perks that are listed on this card. And I think we have 800 recruiters here. So um, like I said, I think it's the best thing that you could do if you receive good service by handing this to somebody and say, you should explore working at the best retirement community in the city of Richmond. Um, so look forward to this card um, in your mailbox here in the next day or so. Um, speaking of recruitment, two more great pieces of news. Uh, Matt Dameron and I have formed an alliance with, the, with two community colleges, John Taylor and Jay Sarge. Both of those communities have a, a, a workforce um, alliance group, and we have been partnering with a school named Fresh Start. So Cedar Field, Fresh Start, and this workforce alliance are teaming up and we are going to be a site, Cedar Field is going to be a site for future certified nursing assistants. This, this Fresh Start School is going to provide the curriculum. The Workforce Alliance group through these two community colleges are going to provide the funding. There's $20 million at the state level uh, available for funding. Uh, to help uh, people go to school to become a CNA. And Cedarfield is going to be the host site for these folks to go through their clinicals. At our last meeting, I said, how many people do you think would come through this class each month? And they said, oh, there's about 700 emails that we need to respond to in the last uh, two or three weeks. And so they think they can get about 20 students a month go through the program right here at Cedarfield. So great news on that partnership. And then the, the further good news about that is Matt Dameron and Tamika Ross, the DON, have first access to new people getting into the most important profession at any nursing home, assisted living, or retirement community. And we can help mold them to our culture, our person first centered culture. So we're very, very excited about that partnership. Um, secondly, this morning I was on a, a Zoom call. I'm now part of a, um, a workforce task, uh, a, wor a task workforce with the VCU uh, gerontology program where we're constantly, we're now looking at their accreditation program and working with uh, them to uh, make sure that their program um, uh, has all the elements uh, that are needed to prepare future licensed leaders to lead memory care, assisted living, and or um, the health center. So uh, we, we are now really forming a, a stronger partnership with VCU, who has a 30-year um, a history of a gerontology program uh, down there. And uh, we're going to do some, some neat things across organizational line. Uh, one more thing about uh, recruitment and retention. Uh, last week, uh, Leading Age Virginia, which is an advocacy group here um, at the state level, uh, has an annual conference. Uh, this year was all virtual, um, and so they availed themselves a, a, a price point to make the conference available to whomever we wanted to within our management team. Typically at this conference, there's usually probably like three or four of us that go to Roanoke or Virginia Beach uh, to attend the conference. Um, but last week, there were 42 supervisors, managers, or directors through three days learning from industry experts um, on this virtual conference. So um, just one example of many things that we're doing to uh, retain people. We keep talking about recruitment here in the last couple of months, but we got to retain our own. We have to lift them up and prepare them for um, uh, to lead the community. So 42 people went through uh, that conference last week. So anyone has any questions about recruitment, retention, or this recruitment card, 
please stop by the administration office and we will answer as many questions as timely as we can. A uh, little therapy update. Um, on June 24th, mark your calendars. There is another um, series called Well to the Core that is being uh, presented by our therapy team. And it really has to do with um, our posture and strengthening our core muscles. Um, and why is that important? Because there really is another epidemic uh, within people 65 years of age and better, and that's balance and falling. And when we work at our core and we're strengthening those muscles and our posture, uh, there, we have a, a significant uh, reduction in the propensity to fall. So mark your calendars, June 24th, well to the core. Uh, just a couple other administrative updates. Um, I don't know if you all know this, but Governor Northam declared June, the month of June, LBGTQ Pride Month in Virginia not too long ago. Uh, this Pride Month, uh, we are reminded of the resilience of the LBGTQ uh, community and their fight for inclusion and uh, acceptance and really equal access to services and career opportunities. Um, and I can't, oh, I just can't help, every time I hear the word diversity, equity, um, inclusion, I can't help but to think of Pete Davis and Barbara Fiske um, that helped start a um, a DEI action team almost three and a half years ago. Um, we, uh, as we celebrate June uh, this month and uh, the diversity of our beloved Cedarfield community, I just want to recognize the contributions already right here at Cedarfield uh, the LBGTQ community is making uh, to really make our community more welcoming um, and affirming not just a place to work, but also a place to live. And so if you have interest in serving on an action team that um, it's, a, it's a pretty influential action team, uh, please contact Barbara Fiske. We are regrouping and retooling now that the pandemic is coming, is, is significantly decreasing, and uh, we're gathering folks to um, light a fire on our initiative and our mission statement within our diversity, inclusion, and uh, uh, equity action team. So I hope that Barbara Fiske's phone rings off the hook in the next 24 hours. Um, speaking of um, inclusion and trying to disrupt um, some decade-old um, bad things that have happened, there's another there's another item that I wish to, and Florence, we wish to disrupt, and it, um, there, there's been a movement here in the last three years around the United States, um, and right here in Richmond at VCU, they've been doing some great work around disrupting ageism. And uh, Florence and I would like to really, in our, in our let me back up a second, in our very own vision statement at Cedarfield and Pinnacle Living, we talk about a vision in which age does not define the person. Age does not define the person. And um, Florence and I were talking a couple days ago, and we were pointing to countless things that we can point to where um, that exists even just right here at Cedarfield. And so Florence and I, um, we really think that we need to go on another path to, to help the cause of disrupting ageism, of educating residents and team members and families about the pervasive, invisible nature of ageism um, that really exists here at Cedarfield and really in, in our region. Um, it's, uh, it should be now a fundamental aspect of everything that we do uh, right here at our community, including um, it should be the bedrock around formation and recruitment and retention and, in, and in community engagement. So 
Um, in case you don't know what disrupting ageism means, um, it is uh, raising more awareness of the uh, inequity and the discrimination um, and recognizing and understanding how language and actions impact um, the, the larger cultural narrative around um, aging. Um, our community strategic plan now includes and will focus over the next um, couple of years on learning how uh, communication and the transmission of ages, age-isms um, in order to help us free uh, of Cedarfield and our general society of it and we're going to focus on evidence-based uh, mechanisms so we can disrupt the cycle um, all in an effort to achieve better wellness outcomes for people, for team members and residents and like. So another plug is if you wish to serve on an action team around disrupting ageism, uh, please contact Florence and I. Uh, we would like to start our first uh, meeting in the next 30 days. So uh, in the next couple of days, we would respectfully uh, uh, ask that residents or team members or families that are listening, anybody wants to join our cause, uh, please contact one of us and we'll put you on the list. Thank you so much for listening to both of those uh, announcements. Uh, one more uh, tidbit about maintenance. We have aging elevators at Cedarfield. We have elevators that have been here for 25 years. And probably those elevators, when they were installed, they were already aging themselves <laughs> um, because of uh, when the time it takes to actually manufacture a, an elevator. So our elevators are probably 27, 28 years old. Um, so I know we, there was one elevator in the atrium cafe that was down for three and a half weeks. And trust me when I say that the elevator, it was not down for lack of trying to get the parts. Um, the parts with these elevators are very difficult to find because the elevators are very aging. I just want to rest assured that the maintenance team was on the elevator uh, outage uh, at the atrium cafe from day one. It took that long to find the parts. Uh, and the labor to repair the elevator. Those ele we have nine elevators at Cedarfield, old elevators that is, and those elevators are on our five-year capital plan uh, to replace them over time over the next five years. Not only the, um, the infrastructure of the elevator, but also the, uh, the renovation of the cab themselves to give them uh, a, a more of a contemporary look. So, um, Anyone has any questions about elevators? Please contact Jack Johnson. <laughs> um, just two more things for me about our master plan expansion. Um, the A wing, which is the health services administration wing. Um, we have the, our construction team had a little slip in the schedule uh, from the beginning of September to the end of September. We can expect the fourth floor of that wing uh, to open up and the assisted living uh, dining room and the assisted living wing on the third floor, those couple apartments down that wing as well, are, are due to open up at the end of August. If anyone has any questions about that uh, phase of our master plan, please feel free to come down to the administration suite or certainly feel free to call Matt Dameron, the associate executive director. Last thing for me, uh, before Trish comes up here to share some great news and spiritual well-being. Um, just want to say happy Father's Day. It's uh, the holiday to honor uh, fatherhood and parental bonds, um, as well as um, just celebrating all that fathers do in society. Just want to give a little plug as an adoptive father. Um, there are 6,000 children in the Commonwealth probably changed through the pandemic. Um, Pre-pandemic, 6,000 children in the foster system. Uh, those kids need father figures too. Um, 
and we have 500 people that live here, 300 people that work here, and we all have our networks. Um, if you know of people, or perhaps you are one of them, that uh, feeling uh, blessed of how um, you were surrounded by a father or a father-like figure that really molded you, um, I would uh, either, I'm advocating to strongly consider maybe looking at uh, fostering as an, adopt as an option, um, and or maybe within your own family networks or friend networks, church networks, synagogue networks. Um, keep your eye out for father, good, great fatherhood figures that might make a significant difference in the foster system. It is desperately needed. 6,000 children um, are in the foster system at this point. So happy Father's Day. Hope you uh, everyone that's watching uh, reaches out to either their father or their someone that supported them um, uh, through their uh, through their childhood. Okay, Trish is here for some spiritual well-being. Good afternoon, Cedar Field. You know, part of the the job of a chaplain is to help find coping skills for all that life sends our way. It may surprise you to know that one of our primary threats to our lives is our own anger. When we don't learn to handle our own anger well, it will endanger and can even destroy us. The mishandling of anger is related to every present and future problem we have, and it damages many of our relationships. In 2019, AARP Magazine published an article concerning the impact of anger on our health. In it, various doctors weigh in, weighed in on the connections between anger and our heart health in particular. The article concluded by indicating that when we can learn from our anger, it is as important as any dietary change you can make for your heart health. People don't realize the extent of its damage. The good news is that we can learn to handle our impulses when dealing with anger. Dutch priest Henry Nouwen describes resentment as cold, agonizing anger. When anger grows cold, he says it hardens your heart and wreaks havoc in your life. Resentment makes us suspicious, cynical, and even depressed. Resentment can become a way of being if we're not careful. Many of us live with cold anger, the deep feeling that life has let us down, that we may suffer unjustly, and that nothing can be done about our complaints. Resentment can be vicious as it makes human relationships and community life so difficult. It can prevent us from seeking forgiveness and robs us of our joy. It is said that the opposite of resentment is gratitude. Gratitude enables us to let go of anger. Moving from resentment to gratitude requires moving towards something more life-giving. Resentment blocks our actions, while gratitude allows us to move toward new possibilities. In order to move from, from resentment to gratitude, we have to admit and be honest with ourselves about the resentments that are holding us back. By doing this, we make space for forgiveness and freedom. Once our resentments are acknowledged. Our next step is to look with new eyes 
toward things for which we are grateful, even small things. I wish each of you a journey toward gratitude with God's help.